This episode, and others like it, are brought to you by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support this channel, join our patrons-only Discord, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. Every week on this channel, I focus on critiquing a different aspect of capitalist society. And every week, I get comments telling me that I'm not doing my job. Because it turns out that what I'm critiquing isn't actually capitalism. No, no, none of this is capitalism, stupid YouTube man. It's corporatism. Or better yet, it's crony capitalism. Or actually, it's the very trendy techno-feudalism. Real capitalism is basically perfect, so if anything is wrong, it's probably because of something else with a different name. In this video, I'm going to be debunking that idea as thoroughly as I possibly can, because I'm pretty tired of getting these misguided comments. It's not corporatism, it's not crony capitalism, it's just plain old capitalism. Let's start with the definition for crony capitalism, because although these comments tend to use the word corporatism, unless the US recently began running its economy on a model of tripartite negotiations or instituted a guild-based system of differentiated welfare and privileges, corporatism is the wrong word. So, crony capitalism it is. Wikipedia says, Crony capitalism, sometimes called cronyism, is an economic system in which businesses thrive not as a result of free enterprise, but rather as a return on money amassed through collusion between a business class and the political class. This is often achieved by the manipulation of relationships with state power by business interests rather than unfettered competition. Then it lists out a couple ways that might happen and sums it up, Money is then made not merely by taking a profit in the market, but through profiteering by rent-seeking using this monopoly or oligopoly. So now that we have a good idea of what these people are saying, let's get three things clear. One, I have an a priori objection to capitalism. I don't just focus on capitalism's consequences on this channel, I think it's a messed up idea at its core. Capitalism, crony or not, is an economic system where a tiny, unelected minority of people get the vast majority of people to work for them so that they can get wealthier. You might think that's alright, I happen to think it's wrong. The place we spend most of our waking hours is run by a guy who has to prioritize profit over everything else, including the well-being of the people that work there. Under capitalism, you have the choice between working for the unelected guy, beating the odds and becoming the unelected guy yourself, or starving. None of that particularly appeals to me. I also happen to think that business acumen shouldn't be a justification for power. Just because Elon Musk is a business super genius, just look at how well he's handling Twitter, doesn't mean his decisions should matter more. The same way that the divine right of kings was a BS justification for feudalism. I think democracy should apply to the economy. Crony or not, capitalism isn't something I support. Two, the things that ANCAPs and libertarians complain about with crony capitalism, like monopolies and oligopolies, companies that can basically get away with whatever they want, are natural consequences of the pure, free market capitalism they defend. When companies ruin competition, it's not necessarily because of something the state does. Free market competition always leads to this scenario where a few corporations dominate and extract rent. Monopolies inevitably develop within capitalism, and whether they got that status with the help of the state or on their own doesn't matter. They are still a monopoly. They still do whatever they want. It still sucks. Three, there's no such thing as a free market in the first place. The distinction between crony capitalism and pure capitalism is based on the vague idea that crony capitalism is when government too big. At some point, one that is impossible to precisely define, there's too much state intervention and that's why it all goes wrong. At least, that's the idea. ANCAPs incorrectly believe that there is such a thing as capitalism without a state, and libertarians are vague about the amount of state intervention they deem to be okay. And as a result, anytime something bad happens, it can just be chalked up to too much intervention, called crony capitalism, and they continue to clamor for small government. But there is no such thing as markets without a state, or without intervention, because markets don't exist in their own little world. All capitalism will involve state intervention. That intervention will necessarily benefit some at the expense of others. Companies will always find ways to influence that process to their benefit by using strategies like capital flight or capital strikes. And that means capitalism will always inevitably be crony. Therefore, the distinction doesn't matter. Let's start with the point about monopolies. Regardless of state intervention, collusion, or whatever, monopolies are an inevitable feature of capitalism. And that's because all companies want to monopolize. 
When it comes to making more profits than everybody else, which is the prime directive of every single capitalist, becoming a monopoly is clearly the way to go. When you're a monopoly, or don't have meaningful competition, prices are whatever you say they are, work conditions are whatever you decide them to be, and profit margins are pretty much up to you. Every company is gunning for the number one spot, and in a competitive market, somebody will eventually get it. It's a zero-sum game. If you are less profitable than your competition, only a couple things can happen. You will gradually either be phased out and fail, because your competition attracts more investors who just follow the higher rate of returns, or your competition will buy you out before that happens. And if horizontal integration isn't an option, companies will integrate vertically and own every part of the manufacturing process to run a leaner business. As they get larger, whether they acquire vertically or horizontally, companies benefit from economies of scale. They have better prices because they buy in bulk or control production from the start. They have more money to invest into R&D to stay ahead of the pack. And they have a bigger market share thanks to a more powerful advertising strategy. The rich get richer, and what starts out as a fair competition rapidly descends into monopoly or oligopoly once someone gets an edge and the means to hold on to it. Google and Facebook aren't going anywhere anytime soon because they have hundreds of mergers and acquisitions under their belts. And just look at Walmart. It starts out with a single local store, then it becomes a couple stores in a few towns, then a couple hundred. And soon enough, over two million people are working for the same company, making so little that even full-time workers need to be on food stamps. Mom and pop shops can't compete with their low prices. At the end of the day, monopoly or oligopoly is inevitable when there are winners and losers in a competitive market because the winners take over what they used to share or compete over with the losers. Antitrust regulation makes this a little better, but that's state intervention, so not a great argument against crony capitalism. And even with antitrust laws in place, oligopolies form all over our economy. Big tech is dominated by just a few corporations. So is mass media, telecommunications. Online shopping happens almost exclusively on Amazon. And of course, the food and beverage business is dominated by just a handful of brands. In theory, innovation is supposed to combat this effect a little bit. But now that tech startups have realized it's more profitable to be bought out by Meta than foolishly try to outcompete it, innovation isn't going to change all that much either. Only massive breakthroughs can change the hierarchy, the way the internet did in the late 90s and early 2000s. But whether IBM or Google is on top doesn't matter if it's still an oligopolistic system. It's still gonna suck. There is no version of capitalism that respects competition, but not competition's outcomes. If your idea is to turn the clock back to when there was more competition, it'll only be a matter of time until we're right back here. It's not a solution. So now let's talk about state intervention and regulation. There's no capitalism without a state, and no avoiding collusion between the state and corporations. The prime function of the state in a capitalist society is creating an environment where businesses are profitable. The state depends on the profit of the capitalist class. It delegates the responsibility of organizing the economy to capitalists. And in turn, capitalists depend on the state to make sure that the conditions are right for them to profit. At the most basic level, that means the state needs to be there to enforce contracts. In the background of every business contract, there is the state to make sure both parties follow through. Behind the ownership of a business, there is also the state, making sure that someone with a stockpile of guns doesn't knock on the door and take it over. The police and the legal systems are there to provide a baseline arrangement to make sure that violence between capitalists doesn't happen outside the rules of business. But now, what counts as the rules of business? Those have to be defined. Is it state intervention if the government fines a company for taking over another one the wrong way? That's a tricky question. It's not clear what it means to uphold private property rights in practice. And what about intellectual property? In some places, the state protects patents, and in others it doesn't, because for some countries, it's more profitable not to enforce them. Isn't the state intervening in the economy as soon as it makes that decision? The reason you could argue it either way is because there are no natural conditions on which to base an economy. Economies have to be created. States in the past couple hundred years since capitalism began have had to, and still continue, to make decisions. They facilitate trade by creating a currency, taxing in that currency to give it value, setting rules for proper engagement, and enforcing those rules. In short, they need to intervene because without their intervention, there'd be no economy to speak of. 
If you go one level deeper, the state's intervention is absolutely necessary to maintain the exploitation of people under capitalism. Capitalism is incredibly exploitative and incredibly unequal. Most people work long hours and live right on the edge of poverty, while a tiny minority work no hours and fly their private jets to their fifth mansion. In order to keep this machine turning and stop it from imploding on itself French Revolution style, you need a state to shape the cultural consensus that capitalism is valid and necessary, and a police force and legal system to give muscle to the enforcement of capitalist relations. If I had to summarize that with just two quotes, the industrial laborer works for and is exploited by the factory owner. And when he organizes in opposition, in comes the policeman who breaks his bones, the sheriff who evicts him, and the judge who jails him. And accumulation, because it is based on exploitation, cannot be sustained at the level of the individual producer-employer alone. It requires legal, ideological, and cultural institutions. It needs state organs and other power organizations. It has to be framed, shaped, and contained from above. In short, it requires the political power of a nation-state. So, now that the state exists, and it has to for capitalism to continue, how are capitalists going to take advantage of it? Are they going to finance the campaigns of the candidates they like? Collude with politicians and make shadowy deals? Become elected themselves and go through the revolving door so that they can run the country in whatever way helps their business? Sure, they could do all that, and they do, but they don't have to to get the same results. If businesses are unhappy with something the government is doing, they just stop investing and the economy goes into a tailspin. No need to influence the government in a crude way. Capitalists just go on an investment strike or they simply invest in another country. The government tends to want to avoid that, so it usually doesn't even get to that point. And just like that, the state and business is colluded without anyone accusing them of cronyism. Some businesses will benefit from it, others won't. The outcome is the same as if there had been a bribe or an exclusive contract. Except this is real capitalism because all the state did was guarantee the conditions for profitability, which any libertarian will tell you it should. Ultimately, as long as you have private property, the profit motive, and wage labor, you have capitalism. That those basic elements lead to objectionable things doesn't make them any less capitalistic. Capitalism isn't a neutral economic system. It always ultimately favors those who sit at its helm. So when that means screwing over the vast majority of people, that is always the direction it will go. As one final analogy, and this is how I usually explain it to commenters, you wouldn't call stage 4 cancer a different disease than cancer. It's simply the progression of the same disease. No matter what perverse, mutated versions of capitalism appear, if the economic base remains the same, if the profit motive is still the driving force, we live under capitalism. You can call it what you want, but that won't change reality. Nor will it solve the problem. The problem is capitalism. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that my channel is only possible thanks to my patrons on Patreon. As some of you may remember, I used to make general interest science videos. I didn't particularly enjoy it, but it was easy to get sponsors for that kind of content. When I made the switch to political content, something I actually do enjoy, most of my sponsors bailed. It's understandable, not many brands want to associate with anti-capitalist content, but that means I've had to rely more heavily on the generosity of viewers like you. I've got one reliable sponsor left, and it's a little nerve-wracking not to have much predictable income to count on. If you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate your support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. It's a great place to hang out. We've got everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, to countless other channels to chat, learn, and explore your interests. We've built a great little community, and we'd love for you to be part of it. So if you'd like to help keep this channel afloat and get some great perks while you're at it, consider becoming a patron by visiting patreon.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my other content by following the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.